Well, good morning, Shannon Oaks family. So thankful to, well, our hearts are just filled with Thanksgiving this morning, and we, we, we've got to start with this. Could we ask every mom and every expectant mom, could y'all stand at this time? Everybody just stand. Come on. All stand. As Phil said, we love you and thank you, moms. And uh, you're going to hear a lot in my message today about how, how thankful that we are for you. Uh, when you came in, you saw on your chair that there was a card that said, Welcome. We mean that. We are so thankful that everyone's here this morning. If you're a guest or a member, we're so blessed to have you. You, you just fill this room with so much joy and love, and we're so thankful you're here. What we do with these cards, they're very important to us. These cards are really used as an act of worship. And so we ask every guest, every member, everyone present to fill these cards out. You'll notice at the bottom of the card, there's a rectangle. That rectangle is a very important place on that card. This is where we either write a praise to God, just something you're thankful for. Or a prayer request. Maybe you know someone who's going through a hard time. Someone who's going through an illness. It might even be you. We have a prayer team that prays over these prayer requests every day of the week. So at the end of our service, we're going to pass baskets. And we offer these cards as an act of worship. So please do that uh, if you would. I want to tell you, uh, here at Shannon Oaks, we've had an amazing year together. And next Sunday night... We're going to kind of close out our, our year together, uh, almost like a school year, as we look back on all the ways God has blessed us since last summer. We're going to have an all-churchwide fellowship. Everyone, we want guests to come, members to come, uh, whether you are in a life group or not in a life group, we want everyone to come. It's going to be right here. We'll have tables set up at 6 o'clock. Our, our team that makes our meals on Wednesday night, they're making us spaghetti that night. And so on your card, if you could simply write for us dinner and the number of people you're bringing next Sunday, that's really going to help our food prep. Our life groups are bringing the sides and the desserts. So please, just if you would, give us how many are coming uh, with you next Sunday night and write that on your card. And John and Betty and that whole crew will thank you for that. That night, by the way, uh, Dadrian Smith, my wife, uh, Talisa, are directing our children's program that night. It's going to be an incredible night. All the kids will be with Daydream, the teens, Talisa, and some others who are volunteering that night to be with the kids during the time we're in here. So free child care, free, free meal. The band is going to be playing that night. It's going to just be an amazing night of praise and fellowship and just Thanksgiving. We're going to have eight different individuals kind of give a testimony of why they're thankful for this last year. Be here. Sign up on that card right now, and we'll know who's going to be coming. As you know, what's coming up in a few weeks for us is one of the biggest outreaches we have here at Shannon Oaks. We, last year, we had 50 ice cream freezers in this room. We had 700 people from the community come to eat this homemade ice cream. The ice cream freeze-off is one of the highlights of the year. We are still needing some folks to make homemade ice cream. We as a church, we own freezers that you can even borrow for the event. Would you write freezer on your card if you can help? We still need help, so please, if you can, we'll give you recipes if you need recipes, but we need help. As a part of that, as you know, we have an amazing balloon festival. Uh, I think we have, I don't know, 30, 40 balloons. Balloonists come all over the United States. They come here. Our 40 acres is just filled with, with balloons. And if you would like to be a part of that event, David and Pam Black, who are members here, they kind of coordinate this event. They need help. They need volunteers. You might even be a part of a balloon crew. Who knows? You might even go up in a hot air balloon. But if you'd like to be a part of that, would you either at the Connect Center, sign up, or write balloon on your card. So much going on. Before I get into my message this morning, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for, for this morning. God, I'm thankful for the leadership of our country who, who over 100 years ago said, hey, set aside one day for moms. 
God, we are thankful for the moms because they remind us of the kind of love that you have for us, Father. Now, God, as I, as I, as I share this morning about a mom in, in your word in the Bible, God, speak through me. Help me to get out of the way. May we all leave different than we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you have them, to, to 1 Samuel. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. It was 1908. The lady's name was Miss Anna Jarvis. She lived in Philadelphia. And according to history, she's the first person that ever observed Mother's Day. She wanted that to spread. And so that next year, from 1908 to 1909, she went across the country encouraging people to make it a national day. She even went to politicians. And so if you know much about history, you know that six years later, Congress affirmed and the president signed and made it a nationwide, a traditional holiday for the United States of America. About that time, there was a quote that came out, and I may not have it exactly right, but this is what it said. A great nation is built on the back of godly mothers. I like that. This morning, I want us to focus on a single story in the Word of God that shows the truth of that statement. It's the story of a mom whose characteristics you may have seen in your mom. These characteristics I think we'll bring every one of us this morning to the point of saying, thank you, Mom. We meet this lady in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Her name is Hannah. Her, her name speaks of beauty. Her name means grace. And she first appears in 1 Samuel 1 as the book opens, and she's barren. She's childless. And then she becomes a mother, and she becomes a mother of one of the greatest men who ever walked on the face of the earth. His name is Samuel. And as you see the account of the birth of Samuel, you're going to note what you might call the profile of a godly mother. As the book opens, it is what's called in your Bible the period of the judges. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, as you were reading the story Bible in chapter 8, by the way, if you're visiting with us, our entire church is going through the Bible in 31 weeks. This book has put the Bible in chronological order. And if you'd like a copy of that, it's available for you uh, at our Connect Center afterwards. But we're going through it. And, and what I want to tell you is that, that two weeks ago, we read that. Now, in our staff meeting every week, we read whatever chapter we're on. And I want to tell you it blesses us. Do you realize as a church, we've sold or given away over 400 of the story Bibles since we started. That's, that's amazing. So if you don't have one yet, please pick one up. Anyway, this is the period of the judges. There's no king in Israel yet. It's a time of turmoil. It's a time of confusion. It's a time when Israel is very vulnerable to their enemies, especially the Philistines. It's a time when the nation was debauched morally. Religion had grown cold. It was a time for a great man to rise up. It was a time when leadership was needed. It was a time of political distress. Samson, who you've heard of, was now dead. The country was divided. The country was leaderless. The priesthood itself, church, was corrupt. There were more scandals. They were rampant everywhere in the families of the priest. The nation was weak. The nation was impotent. And worst of all, when you get to chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. What the nation needed was a great leader, a great man, and God used a great woman to shape that great man. 
God used Samuel, one of the greatest men who ever walked on the earth. Listen to me and listen carefully. What this story is going to tell us this morning is that Samuel was not only the product of the work of God, he was the product of a godly mother. She gave to her nation, Hannah did, the world's greatest legacy of what any woman can ever give a nation, and that is a godly child, a godly child. So let's start in verse 1, verse 1, verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jaroham, the son of Eliu, the son of Toyu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. So here's the setting for our story. Here we see a man who has two wives. One is called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children. Hannah had no children. Hannah, by the way, as we said earlier, means grace. And I want you to know in that day, it was a very common Eastern name. But here's my question. What's going on here? Why is this guy, Elkanah, why is he marrying two women at this time in world history? Well, you know, the Bible never says God approved of the practice of polygamy. He simply allowed it at a period of time in world history. God designed, now listen to me carefully, God designed that a man and a woman would leave their parents and unite together as one. It doesn't take an Israel Lewis or any other psychologist we have here in our class, I mean in our, in our, our auditorium this morning, to tell you the problems that come with polygamy. They are numerous. This morning, we're going to see two. We're going to see rivalry, and we're going to see emotional pain. And so Elkanah has created for Hannah a very difficult situation. We don't know the details, but it may well have been that he went to marry Penina because Hannah couldn't have children. And so he married Penina in order to produce a generation that could possess his inheritance. What would even make the pain deeper for Hannah was that she had to be in a home where she saw this taking place. Penina had children. Hannah could not. I just want you to pause for a minute in emotion and just think about the emotional pain that Hannah went through. Hannah lived with a husband who had another wife, who had children, and she could not. But I want you to note this. Elkanah loved Hannah. Her husband loved her. We know this from just reading the text. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. But even though he loved her, church, her emotional pain was intense. And what made matters even worse is the Paniah rubbed it in. She rubbed it in. Look with me in verses 6 and 7. Penina kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Can you imagine the emotional pain? First of all, you're living in this house. You can't have kids. The other lady can't. And on top of that, now she provokes you. She talks about it. She needles you. The pain is going to have to surface in you eventually if you're Hannah. And it did. Look deeper at verses 6 and 7. 
until she wept and she would not eat. I know in this room, some of you have been so distraught and so depressed that you have wept endlessly, that you've had no appetite. This is where Hannah was. And I want to pause for just a minute in this message. And I want to look, if I could, I want all men to listen to this, at the response of her husband to her weeping and her depression. I want you to look at the response of Elkanah to Hannah. Now, let's just stop, men, for a second. This is important. (laughs) What do you do, men, when your wife is crying, when she is upset, when she is distraught? You might know the reason why she's crying, and you might be totally clueless. But what do you do? Talisa and I have been on many marriage retreats since 1985. And I can promise you, I have never heard a resource speaker tell the men on the retreat to do what you're going to see Elkanah do. Does here. It's, it's not in there. Let's look at verse 8. Here we go. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Now, let me tell you how he's approaching her. He's approaching her logically. Logically. He says, Hannah, he says, listen, Hannah, do you know how many women out there have arranged marriages? Their husbands don't love them. They're just living with them. You've got a husband that loves you. I need you, Hannah, to see the glass half full. That's not what you do, men. When our wives are crying, when our wives are distraught, This is what we learn on marriage retreats. You go up and you sit beside them. You put your arm around them and you say nothing. (laughs) They don't want a solution. They want to know you care. Women, you can say amen if you want to. (laughs) They don't want a solution. They want to know you care. So I, I, I've got to do this while we're here, okay? Our marriage retreat is, is the 14th to the 16th, okay? If you want your husband to learn strategies like that and more, put marriage on your card. We'll send you the information about the marriage retreat. We're, we're taking 40 couples to Arkansas next year, and we want to make sure that you know all about that. So here's what I want you to know. Hannah's distraught, and understandably so. But in the midst of this very low point in her life, she's going through what I talked about in our video last week. If you're doing the the breakthrough videos with us, we have 160 adults in here, by the way, doing that. If you're doing those breakthrough videos, last week we focused on what does it mean to go through the desert? What does it mean to go through the wilderness? What does it mean to go through a, a, a low time in your life? That's where Hannah is. And so if you would, open up your bulletin. And what I will do is I want to give you five strategies that Hannah shows us here, five things Hannah did that will produce a godly child. Produce a godly child. So get you a pen and get ready. We're going to look at five principles that are the DNA of producing a godly child. Number one, Hannah had a passion for the Lord's best. She had a passion for for the Lord's best. Now, what do I mean by that? Listen, she wanted a child. She desperately wanted a child. She wanted a child so much, she wept. She fasted. Her heart was broken over the fact she could not have a child. But I don't believe her motive was selfish. She didn't want to live out her unfulfilled fantasies by having a child. She didn't want a child so she could show off the child. 
She didn't want a child to fill her own need for love. She wanted a child to give to God. She wanted a child because she knew that was God's best for her, to raise a child for His glory. I just just want to say this this morning. I've got to say this. I don't believe for a second that this child had to come from her own body. I don't believe that. When you study Hannah, I, I think had the Lord not opened her womb, and given her a baby in a different way, when you study this, I think what would have happened, she would have rejoiced and been just as excited. Because what she had a passion for was to raise a child in the Lord. She had a passion for the Lord's best. She had a desire to have a child so she could produce God's best. She wanted to honor, she wanted to glorify God, and she knew the best gift of God's love ever given to a woman was the opportunity to raise a child. What I'm saying is that Hannah was not a reluctant mother. She was not a mother who felt a child was an intrusion. She was not a mother who felt that way. She was a godly mother who longed to have a child. She had a passion for children. Seeing a child, she saw that child as a gift of God. A godly mother longs to raise a child. If she has no child, she weeps. It's not a whim. It's the belief that having the opportunity to raise a child is a gift from God. And this was characterized by her passion for God's best. When you get to verse 7 and 8, we demonstrate her passion. And that's the second point today. Hannah was characterized by prayer. Hannah knew, because of her passion, where she needed to go. She knew where she needed to look. Verse 9, look at it with me. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Church, Eli's the high priest. He's in the temple. She goes there. She came to the temple greatly distressed. Look at verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me. Her soul was bitter. It literally says that. She prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly. She is crushed. And so what does she do? She made a promise. She made a vow. And not forget your servant, but give her a son. And then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. But notice this about Hannah. She was a woman of prayer. It is her characteristic. She understood, now listen to me, that God is the source of children. Her distinctive virtue was her faith, her constant faith. Verse 12, and she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were, were not, uh, and, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. She remained there. She stayed there. Her heart was broken. She was pouring out her prayers. This is the spirit of true prayer. The half-brother of our Lord Jesus said this about prayer. James 5, 16, the prayer of of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Hannah exemplifies this verse. She slipped into the sanctuary of God and she began to pour out her heart in honest, open faith, totally dependent on God alone to weave life in her womb. That's what Psalm 139 says. If you don't know that Psalm, write it down. Psalm 139. So her passion Turn to prayer. This speaks, church, of her heavenly relationship. She knew where to go with her problems. You know something I started thinking about in reading this point? Wouldn't it be amazing if you had a book of every prayer your mom ever said for you? Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? My mom's here today. She's 
She's 94 years old. I got the calculator out. 25,000 prayers. I would have a book of 25,000 prayers. Can you imagine when we get to heaven, if, if we're able to look at those prayers and see those prayers, how thankful, how encouraged we will be. Let me just say something to the church here. You guys encourage me when it comes to prayer. As we started the service, I asked you to write down prayers. You know, when we first started doing this, we would get like one page of prayers that we would send to our prayer ministry. Eventually, it became two pages of prayers. And then you started to get it as a church. Guests started to get it as a church. Then it went to three pages. Recently, it's been four pages of prayer requests. Because you understand what Hannah understood. You understand the power of prayer. And Hannah understood that. Hannah was passionate about God's best. Hannah was characterized by prayer. And thirdly, write this down. Hannah was a woman who kept her promise. Hannah made a vow. Hannah made a promise. Look at verse 11 with me. Do not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. When she says here, do not forget, she doesn't mean, God, don't forget me. She's referring to her prayer. Don't forget what I'm saying. I'm passionate for a child. Then I will. That's the vow part. She'll do what? What's she vowing to do? Well, first of all, she says, I'm going to give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And secondly, she says, a razor will not come to his head. I, I laugh at this when I saw that because, you know, when moms take their, their toddler for the first time to get that haircut, they cry. They cry. Some of you probably did that. You know, you cry. Now, if you took this vow, you would never have to do that. <laughs> never do you. You can see those beautiful curls just come down the rest of their life. You would never do that. That was, if you look at number 6, 3 through 6, it's called the Nazarite vow. In fact, Jews took it all the time. Uh, it, it, sometimes they would take this vow, but it was just for a short period of time. There were four parts to it. Here they are. That he would not cut his hair because he has no concern for his physical appearance. He would not drink wine or any strong drink. Thirdly, he would abstain from banquets and celebrations. And fourthly, he would live an austere, consecrated, God-centered life. Many Jews did that for maybe a month at a time or six months. They would take it for a short period. In our Bible, though, there's three people who did it for their life. Samson, John the Baptist, and here we have Samuel. All their life, they were totally devoted and consecrated to God. No personal self-indulgence, no preoccupation with form or looks or fashion. And so she promised God, I'll give you this child. I just want to be fulfilled as a mother. I just want to raise a godly son so I can give him back to you. This is her promise to present her child to God. Can I say this this morning? That's the essence of every godly mother that's in here. We want to give our children back to God. And that's the essence of this godly mother. Talisa and I have two sons. We love them very much. And they don't live here in Sulphur Springs. We get to be with them maybe five or six times a year. And we treasure every moment. God gave them to us for a period of time. A time when we tried to teach them to love God, to love people, to serve God. But it was just for a time. Back in the 1990s when I was preaching here at Shannon Oaks, there was this wave going across America. People all across America were turning their churches into movie theaters. And we did the same thing here at Shannon Oaks on Sunday nights. They showed episodes of the Andy Griffith Show. You know, when you take the commercials out, it's about 25 minutes. And then they would, show, they would do a spiritual application after they showed the episode. Well, I can tell you, without a doubt, when we did that, the most popular episode of all was called Opie the Birdman. It involved Opie 
finding three little birds whose mother had died. And so he puts them in a cage. Opie feeds the birds. He loves on the birds. He talks to the birds. He gives every individual bird a unique name. And finally, his dad, Andy, comes and says, Now, son, you have to do the last thing that their ma would have done. You've got to let your birds go. Opie replies, But, Pa, what if they can't fly away? Maybe I didn't do all the right things. Hmm. Andy says, you did all the right things. They can fly away. And then Opie gets real excited. And he says, but if they can't fly away, I can just keep them as pets. They can live right here with me. Isn't this dialogue brilliant? And then Opie pauses and he says, but Paul, they don't want to be pets. They're supposed to fly away, just like you said. So Opie takes the cage out in the front yard. He opens up the little cage door, and he takes each bird out one at a time. He calls them by name, and he says, fly. And he watches them fly away. And after the third bird is gone, he, he looks back down at the cage, and he says this. The cage sure looks empty, Paul. Andy pauses for a second. He looks up, and he says, yes, son, it sure does. And then listening to the sounds in the air, he says this, but don't the tree, trees look nice and full? Hannah knew Samuel was a gift, and she promised to release him back to God. Godly mothers know this. Their children are God's, and they are a gift. And one day, we release them back to Him. So what do we learn about Hannah? She had the passion for God's best. She prayed in faith to God. She makes a promise to God and shows the motive of her heart. And now we come to these verses, verses 17 and 18. Let's look at them. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of Him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way, and she ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. My question for you is, why? Why was her face no longer downcast? What, what do we see in Hannah here? So please write this down. Hannah lived out a patient faith. She gave it to God. She demonstrated this belief. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, or when you're going to do it, but I believe you are going to give me a child. And she wasn't frustrated anymore. She had true faith. True faith doesn't say, oh God, here's my problem, and then you walk away feeling the same. That's not faith. That's doubt. True faith says, God, here it is. I trust you. And now your countenance is different because you've given it to God. You cast your burden on God, and that's the end of it. And so she walked away. She eats. She's no longer sad. Can I just say this this morning? And I'm one that I'm thankful for this. If you had a positive, encouraging mother, one filled with patient faith, you are truly blessed. You are truly blessed. Such a mom brings life to a home. Such a mom helps her children start to grasp the powerful concept of the sovereignty of God. Fear and negativity, they're felt in a family, and they can cripple kids. But faith and trust are caught in a home, and they bring life. Finally this morning, Hannah was a woman of praise. When God gave her the child, you get to chapter 2, and here's what you see. It's 10 verses, 10 verses that praise God. We're only going to read two. You can read the others later on. Look what she does once she has her child. 
My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. This is thanks. This is exaltation. She has a thankful heart, and she can't keep it in. This is unbroken praise. It's just a masterpiece. When you read the rest of the other eight verses, you're just going to see a masterpiece of praise. It's like when you get to Luke 1 and you see the mother of Jesus do the same thing, verses 46 through 45, 55, it's the same thing. So think about this. She was a godly mother who was known by her praise. You know, our, our sermon title this morning is this, Thankful for Mom. And let me just say this. There are no perfect moms. But if your mom displayed just one of the five characteristics that we read, read this morning, your heart should be full of thanksgiving today. Did your mom have a passion for God's best? Was your mom a woman of prayer? Did she be, was she a woman who kept her promises? Was she a woman of patient faith? Was she a woman of praise? What a gift moms are to us. I want to close with this, and it's very powerful. It was written decades ago, but it goes with this text so powerfully. The young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked. And her guide said, yes, and the way is hard, and you will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy, and she would not believe that anything could be better than these years. So she played with her children. She gathered flowers for them along the way, and she bathed with them in the clear streams. And the sun shone on them, and life was good. And the young mother cried, nothing will ever be lovelier than this. And then night came, and storm, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold, and the mother drew them close, and she covered them with her mantle. And the children said, Oh, mother, we're not afraid, for you are near, and no harm can come. And the mother said, Well, this is better than the brightness of day, for I've taught my children courage. And the morning came, and there was a hill ahead. And the children climbed, and they grew weary, and the mother was weary. But at all times, she said to her children, a little patience, and we'll get there. So the children climbed, and, and when they reached the top, they said, we could have not done it without you, mother. And the mother, when she lay down that night and looked up at the stars, she said, this is better day than the last, for my children have learned strength in the face of hardness. Yesterday I gave them courage, today I've given them strength. And the next day came strange clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war, clouds of hate, clouds of evil. And the children groped and they stumbled. And the mother said, lift up your eyes to the light. And the children looked up and they saw above the clouds an everlasting glory. And it guided them and it brought them beyond the darkness. And that night, mother talked of Jesus and said, this is the best day of all. I've shown my children God. And the days went on, and the weeks, and the months, and the years. And the mother grew old, and she was little, and she was bent. But the children were tall. They were strong. They walked with faith and courage. And when the way was rough, they lifted her because she was light as a feather. And at last they came to a hill, and beyond the hill they could see a shining road. They could see golden gates that were flung wide. And the mother said, I've reached the end of my journey, and now I know that the end is better than the beginning. For my children, they can walk alone, for they walk with God. And the children said, you will always walk with us, mother, even when you're gone through the gates of the Savior. And they stood and they watched her as she went on alone. And the gates closed behind her. And they said, we cannot see her. 
but she is still with us. A mother like ours is more than a memory. She is a living presence. Thank you, moms. We're thankful for you. And thank you, God, for giving us moms. Let's pray. Father, what a morning we've had together. What a joy it is to be with so many loving, unselfish moms in here that have just impacted this world in ways that we'll only know about when we get to heaven. Father, we thank you for the love that our moms have shown us in whatever way that is because it's taught us how you love us as well. And God, it's my prayer this morning. I believe you've given us the story of Hannah that every mom here would beam with joy knowing that you've given them the gift of life, the gift of life to love, to challenge, to help grow. May every mom here walk out here fulfilled with great joy in their heart. Now, Father, it's my prayer that as we all leave here today, that all of us will be thankful in our hearts, not just for the love we have from our moms, but for the love we learn from our moms about you, about you, God. We pray these things now.